Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in to today's webinar. A webinar that will really focus on the contribution of South-South cooperation in education, strength and development. You are welcome. My name is Yudim Sangano, I'm the chairman of the UGH my Council and the executive director of Alliance for Healthy Communities in Rwanda. I'm excited to host you today alongside an amazing panel of experts. I've been part of the first cohort of the six cohorts that graduated from the University of Global Health Equity since its official opening in 2015. So far, 140 alumni have graduated with a Master of Science in the Global Health Delivery, a program that equipped us with the essentials to develop health care services and fight for social justice. This alumni comes from 20 countries across the world and as such a global outreach makes it essential for us to today to discuss the contribution of south south cooperation in education to strengthen development today's webinar is chaired by the UGHC vice chancellor professor agnes Nagawa, who is currently residing in rwanda She's the vice chancellor and co-founder of the University of Global Health Equity in 2015, an initiative of Partners in Health based in Rwanda, which focuses on changing how healthcare is delivered around the world by training global health professionals who strive to deliver more equitable quality health services for all. She's a Rwandan pediatrician who returned to Rwanda in 2019-16 two years after the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Previously, she has provided clinical care in the public sector and has served the Rwandan health sector from 1996 to 2016 in high-level government positions. First as the Executive Secretary of Rwanda National AIDS Control Commission, then as Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Health. And lastly, as the Minister of Health for five years, she's a professor of pediatrics at the UGHC, a senior lecturer in the Department for Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School, and an, an adjunct clinical professor at pediatrics at Totemus's Jaisal School of Medicine. She's a member of multiple editorial, advisory, and directors of boards including the Think20, T20, the Rockefeller Foundation, the African Europe Foundation, the Commission on Africa, African COVID-19 Response. Professor Binagwao is a, a member of the US National Academy of Medicine and the World Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences. She has published over 220 peer-reviewed that course and was named among the 100 most influential African women for 2020 and 2021. Thank you, Professor Agnes, for chairing today's discussion. Today, we are also together with four guests on the panel. First, we have Professor Pascal Alote. Professor Pascal Alote is the director of the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health. She's a nurse, a midwife, and a public health nurse with postgraduate training in public health, anthropology, and epidemiology. Her research in global health covers health equity, health and human rights, gender and social determinants of health, migration, sexual and reproductive health, tropical diseases, and non-communicable diseases. She has worked in several countries in Africa, Southeast East Asia, and Australia. She pioneered the methodological approaches for engaging communities in research and policy processes to ensure joint ownership and partnership in health and service delivery. Thank you, Professor Pascal, to join us. Secondly, we are with uh, Professor Dr. Abderatif Zelga, who is currently the director of POES. A physicist by education, he holds a doctorate in renewable energy and a master, and master in energetic physics from Tremsin 
University, Algeria, where I had taught for two decades. In 2005, Professor Zega completed postdoctoral research in France, then he moved to solar industry, and he worked as a senior engineer with startups and multinational companies on solar cell technology in German and the United States of America. In 2008, he came back to the university and also conducted numerous international research projects and the PhD supervisions and PhD supervisions from the University of Tremsen and elsewhere. After this long experience, he decided to invest his knowledge in supporting education and youth in Africa. Thank you, Professor Dr. Abdulatif, for joining us today. Thirdly, we are with Professor Anna Mia Ekstrom, who is a clinical professor in infectious disease epidemiology, focusing on HIV. Over the last 14 years, she has led a large number of research projects, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Burkina Faso, and South Africa, aiming at more effective program implementation of HIV prevention and treatment in source poor health systems and high risk context and subpopulations. Tanamia has combined the clinical professorship position at the Karolinska Institute, KI, in the Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden. And she works part time as a clinical specialist in infectious diseases and HIV. She holds a master's of public health and PhD degree in quantitative method from Harvard School of Public Health and a PhD in medical epidemiology from KI. She is a course coordinator for both undergraduate and graduate courses in global health, HIV, infectious diseases, and frequent lecturer. Her areas of expertise include epidemiology, clinical infection disease, medicine, public health, global health, health systems, and maternal health. Key such areas include the prevention of mother-to-child transmission, PMTCT, HIV, AIDS care, and program implementation. Lastly, but not least, we are together with uh, Kate Martin. Dr. Kate Martin is the executive director of Consortium of Universities for Global Health, based in Washington, DC. Between 1993 to 2011, he served as a member of parliament in Canada, Canada's House of Commons, holding portfolios in foreign affairs, international development, defense, and health, and is a member of Queen's Privy Council. He served on numerous diplomatic missions to areas in a crisis, worked as a physician on the Mozambique border during the country's civil war. He has traveled widely in Africa and spent, spent years frontiering on conservation efforts in South Africa. He has published over 170 editorial pieces and was a frequent commentator on television and radio. As you can see, we are blessed to have uh, experts and uh, dear pa panelists, thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar. We are all looking forward to learn from you. I now welcome our Vice Chancellor, Professor Agnes Ivinagoho, to lead us through this webinar. Thank you, Eugène uh, Sangano, for the warm welcome and for speaking on behalf of the UJG Alumni Council, who hosts this webinar about education. Our Alumni Council is a community of global health leaders trained at UJG and collectively they represent the diversity in background experience and perspective that drive innovation in global health. And they are pioneers in new generation of professional tasks with providing directly comprehensive healthcare services or to organize the health service delivery, especially for the most neglected communities around the world. I would like to give a very warm welcome 
a very warm good afternoon, good morning, or good evening to all of you, depending on where you are around the world. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome our esteemed panelists, participants, and partners on this monthly Has Prof. Agnes Equity Webinar Series. So uh, I just want to say that uh, some logistic uh, information for all of those who uh, participate uh, to this webinar to ensure access for people who are hard of hearing, please click on the closed captioning button of the Zoom screen to benefit from a real time text on transcribing. And our panelists have been prompted to be descriptive of any image of their slides to accommodate person with visual impairment. Also, for all the participants, note that at any time, question can be submitted to the, uh, through the chat box. They will all be answered. All questions sent during the time of the webinar will be answered. What we don't have time to answer during the webinar will be answered later on through uh, social media using Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, and especially by the person to who you direct the uh, the question. So on this day, the webinar is dedicated to honor the United Nations International Day of South-South Cooperation that is celebrated annually the 12th September. The 2021 team for South-South Cooperation is aimed at raising a more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable future for the globe as it responds effectively to COVID-19. We know that we have a long way to do before this response was uh, became globally if effective. So inspired by this theme, this month's webinar conversation will be on South-South cooperation in education to strengthen development. Because COVID-19 disrupted seriously the education sector, we will focus on education even if we know that due to the pandemic, the landscape of all development sector has changed. And as countries work toward achieving the 17 sustainable development goal for the 2030 agenda, in all sectors, the South-South cooperation will be an important player among the sustainable development goal, quality of education is included as well as partnership which make our discussion today concerned directly by two major sustainable development goals, partnership and education. But the education is at the heart of all the sustainable development goal, which is also highlighted in the 2063 Africa We Want agenda, because it concerns gender, health, justice, etc. We also we have example of successful South-South cooperation, such as the one supporting capacity building of teachers, trainers, and also teachers in support of curriculum reform, a project that was initiated by UNESCO in 2013 around Africa, Latin America, and the Arab region. And so far, 600, 600 officials have from those regions have benefited from this project. In the Africa context, countries like Kenya have been engaged in various South-South education partnerships successfully, such as the de uh, developing information and technology skills with India and developing business skills with Singapore, to just name a few. We have also other example of South-South cooperation for capacity building in education, including Algeria, that has awarded over 31,000 university scholarship to students from all over Africa, or Nigeria in the nursing sector, or Rwanda, my country, which provided scholarship to Af African refugees and those out of school in Haiti during the first, uh, the consequences of the first out, out, uh, uh, earthquake in 2012. Another successful example is the enhancing teachers 
Education in Africa, a project funded by Chinese government, which with the aim of enhanced teaching and training in sub-Saharan Africa via information and communication technology. And since uh, its beginning in 2012, uh, it has created 100 training workshop, has trained 10,000 of educators, and has created 230 teaching material, module, and policies to improve quality of education and access to education. However, as promising as it sounds, we continue to deal with the insanity of COVID-19, and it shows us that more than ever, we have to increase quality of education, access to education, and this is an economic uh, imperative because all our countries are invested so much in education and it can be more synergistic if we were working together. So we need to reinforce existing South-South cooperation and create new opportunity for new model of partnership and also convince the decision makers that it's important to foster education opportunity, quality of training and opportunity for students that we can equip them with knowledge to later as professionals, allow them to support their country's effort when dealing with crisis. So South-South partnership should also help us to respond to the challenge of retaining qualified professionals and skilled people in the global South and fight against brain drain. So in pushing towards this agenda to bridge the gap of education and skills in Africa, there is a clear need for more South-South cooperation to create synergy and accelerate our journey to achieve the sustainable development goal. So let us use this webinar as an opportunity to reflect on avenues for South-South partnerships, on approach to support and engage new partners based on equities and solidarity and mutual respect. So it's important for us to have our partners from the global north uh, with Anamia uh, talking from Europe and Kate talking for the uh, consortium of the Global Health Equity Universities uh, based in Washington, because they will be key by helping all of us to strength uh, what we plan to do. And before we dive into the discussion, let me begin by asking each of our panelists to give their introductory remarks. So I'm going to start with Professor Alote Pascal from Malaysia who will be sharing with us today about uh, maybe I you I think the floor is yours Pascali you will share with us today about the strong engagement of higher education in promoting education through south south cooperation the floor is yours Pascal Good evening from Kuala Lumpur and the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health, hosted by the government of Malaysia. I'm delighted to join you in this discussion. And the fact that we're having this discussion hosted by UGHE is cause for optimism. And I say this because I'll situate my intervention within the context of some of the dialogues that we're hosting on decoloniality. But before, if I may, an anecdote. If you've been to mar fish markets in Africa or Asia, you'll probably have seen live crab crabs for sale in deep pots, basins, or baskets. Some are left open, others are left lightly covered, and some are weighted down. So here's the story. The crabs in open pots, pot one, have accepted their fate. They know they've been caught. Food is thrown into the container for them. It's not a great life, but it's a life, so they just chill. The crabs in pot two with the lightly covered containers are a little more rebellious. They try to clamber out and they keep climbing and clawing at each other in the effort. The outcome is that they keep pulling each other down and effectively their efforts are in vain. There may be the occasional lucky one that may make it to the top, 
but it's not enough even for the uh, of concern to the vendor. The crabs in pot three, on the other hand, are strategic. They very, they very carefully form a live ladder with one climbing on top of the other and holding the position, allowing others to climb over them until they reach the top. Some crabs can escape and others are prepared to sacrifice to enable that to happen. These are the crabs in the pots that have bolted or weighted covers. The crabs in all three pots are motivated by survival. All three are up against a greater power the difference is whether they act individually or as a collective. So park that story for now. The world faces big, big challenges. The, the pandemic, climate change, peace and security, etc. Big challenges, limited resources, concentrated amongst a few. A corporation agenda should not be a hard sell. And there's a long history of efforts to support it. High income countries do it well. Protectionism is not just a domestic agenda. It also concentrates resources with those who have more than enough to share. And I offer COVID, the COVID vaccine equity as an example. Similar mechanisms to support cooperation exist for low and middle income countries. The Buenos Aires Plan of Action to promote technical cooperation amongst developing countries the main multicultural pillar for South-South Corporation was established in September 1978. The South Center, based in Geneva, was established by agreement in 1994 as an intergovernmental policy and research think tank composed of and accountable to low and middle income countries to support South-South collaboration. Coming closer to home, the Africa Agenda 2063 develops a plan for the Africa we want with seven wonderful aspirations and a range of initiatives. The whole process is forward looking and underpinned by a strong, robust and text contextually driven education center sector. The Pan-African University has already been launched. Um, and, and we have other excellent examples. So for instance, with the University of, uh, University of Global Health Equity hosting this discussion with one of Africa's most influential women, uh, Prof. Agnes, um, the African Leadership Academy founded by Fred Swanica, the Africa CDC, which also represents a shared effort to tackle diseases as well as provide capacity building. Um, now, Despite these structures, the extensive and growing literature on the need to decolonize global health still suggests that we largely remain like the crabs in pots one and two for the following reasons. Funding. Resource imperatives driven by funders and collaborating institutions in the global north pit us against one another. Competition is valued above cooperation and the incentives encourage us to look beyond and devalue Southern partnerships that may strengthen sustainable solutions and privileged ones that may result in greater resources, but less autonomy. Crabs in pot number one. Culture. Many of our institutions continue to value colonial, colonial and patriarchal hierarchies. These stifle creativity and innovation entrench inequities, including gender and diversity. This does not relate just to people, but also to academic disciplines and interdisciplinary engagement. Crabs in pot number two. Cooperation is sold as an opportunity to gain strength in numbers towards an agenda of prosperity. But more than any other time, we have to consider that the future to which we're marching is one where we also need to achieve homeostasis with our planet. Lessons on cooperation also have to be lessons on compromise. For a fairer world, old fuddy-duddies like me need to give way to younger future leaders. A lesson of particular relevance to many male leaders who argue the importance of the status quo. The crabs in pot three are a force to reckon with, and they got that way because they work together, but some had to yield for others to gain. The challenge for us is how we embed these lessons into our education systems, as well as practice what we preach. 
I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanking you for your insightful presentation and the great anecdote of the crab pots. I will never look to crabs the same way again. Now, I would like to give a welcome to our second panelist, Professor Abdelatif Zerga, who will share with us the role of African Union in improving education through South-South cooperation. Professor Abdelatif, the floor is yours. Excellencies, Professor Agnes Bianquao, Vice Chancellor of University of Global Health Equity, Directors, experts in this panel, professors, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We are delighted to receive your invitation to this series of webinars entitled Ask Professor Agnes. Our contribution concerns the role of African Union in improving education through South-South cooperation. The Africa Union's Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, clearly articulated the need for an education and skills revolution. In addition, it cites the need to actively promote science, technology, research and innovation to build knowledge, human resources, capabilities and skills for the African century. The strategic continental frameworks aim to significantly raise educational achievement in terms of access, quality, efficiency, and relevant. Even if we reach uh, until 2020 a good result of implementation of this uh, strategic continental framework, but we are still facing major challenges. Despite the effort of African Union to implement the different strategies for education in 2020-20, we faced a serious challenge with the COVID-19 pandemic. So most African countries with fewer death registered and preceded recession minus 1.93% of GDP, 34 million Africans went to extreme poverty, loss of 7.7% .7 of working hours in Africa and employment fell by 4 million in 2020. Impact on education. So the school's closure uh, the schools closed between 11 weeks in West Africa to more than 40 weeks in Eastern and Southern Africa. The increased student drop rate has been also observed in 2020 and again in 2021. And the transition to distance learning where rapid national shift to replace in-person teaching with various forms of ICT-based remote and distance education. All the situation observed in 2020 required a fast development of innovative learning environments based on as best practices for African Union state members, we would like to share with you some initiatives and flagship projects led by African Union. So the first project concerned the Pan-African University, which is a network of universities aiming to nurture the quality, exemplifying excellence, facilitating the mobilities, limiting the brain drain, and uh, harmonizing the higher education in the continent. Uh, four institutes of the Pan-African University are operated today, and uh, the fifth institute will be launched soon for covering also uh, the southern part of the continent. In addition to the Pan-African University, we have the virtual Pan-African University, which is dedicated for distance uh, teaching and learning. So other initiatives have been undertaken by the African Union. I would like to uh, point out IK so the harmonization of African higher education quality assurance and accreditation and PACAF, the African quality assurance and accreditation frameworks. The other continental initiatives, cooperation with measures such as upscaling new technologies for innovation with the promotion of South-South cooperation through ODA NEPAD in areas including skills, revolution and entrepreneurship through. 
the African Union International Centers for Girls and Women's Education in Africa, AUCIFA, located in Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso, for youth and women capacity building initiative toward entrepreneurship and leadership. In terms of cooperation with development organizations, so UNDP with a network of up to 50 country support platforms and 60 country accelerator labs positioned as key vehicles for helping launch, develop, replicate and scale southern development solutions. Islamic Development Bank with tapping in the presence of the institution in different parts of the world in the knowledge transfer process to and for different countries. Due to the short time, I would like to thank you once again for inviting us and also for allowing us to share the best practices in African Union and I will remain available for any further clarification or information. Thank you and I wish you all the best. Thank you, Professor Adbelatif, for your remark and the role of uh, African Union in providing education through South-South co cooperation. And you have given us so much information that are not enough disseminating, disseminated because even entities like the Consortium of Global Health um, uh, University who want to help to, to bring uh, more um, uh, tools and opportunities inside our continent or uh, what Professor Pascal is doing really could build on that. And uh, this is the, 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 the reason of such a webinar where we can connect and um, plan uh, for better work together. So thank you, uh, Professor Adbelatif. So now uh, allow me to welcome Professor Anamia uh, who will be presenting on how the Western world can support education uh, by supporting South-South cooperation. Uh, Professor Anamia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to give this presentation on how the Western world can support education in South-South uh, cooperation. My name is Anamia Ekstrom. I'm a professor at the Karolinska Institute, and I will share uh, my experiences from uh, 20 plus years of research collaboration and PhD capacity building uh, from a European perspective. Uh, first, uh, the Swedish uh, perspective, the Swedish uh, government agency for international cooperation, CEDA, has a, a long-term and substantial support for uh, higher education and PhD training in Africa and Asia, uh, where I have supervised uh, over 20 PhD students for graduation uh, myself and, and learned a lot uh, over the years. Uh, the uh, CEDA support is devoted to research of relevance for poverty uh, reduction, and you can read more on their webpage. Uh, but uh, in addition to higher education, CEDA is also an important funder, actually, of uh, the UNESCO for primary education, WHO, Gavi, COVAX, and other uh, agencies where uh, the priorities are on SRHR, equity, gender equality, poverty reduction, and of course, for COVAX, uh, more equitable access uh, to COVID vaccines. From a European perspective, uh, EU EDCDB funding uh, is available for joint South-South research uh, consortia, then in collaboration with European partners, at least two or three partners need to be part of most of these uh, grant applications. And in the last uh, funding program, H Horizon 2020, uh, almost 500 uh, contracts were signed, uh, including uh, multiple countries in Europe and Africa and also Asia. Uh, primarily Africa, though, and uh, mounting up to over 700 million euros in funding. And as you can see, uh, most of this actually went into clinical trials research on infectious diseases, tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV, but also emerging diseases and neglected diseases. And uh, a lot of it went into drug and vaccine research, but also diagnostics. Uh, but very little into uh, epidemiologic surveillance, uh, health systems, uh, 
capacity building uh, and strengthening, uh, etc. And there, I think uh, there is a lot that we can do to improve this. Challenge, uh, challenges then that, that I've come across over the years is really that many of the, the most uh, sort of uh, experienced uh, senior researchers and product managers in uh, low and middle income countries are in very high demand uh, since they're too few uh, that, that are sort of uh, that have PhDs, for example, and that can qualify as a, a co-PI in, in the projects we, we're, we're discussing. And this makes them over committed and overwhelmed to a large extent. I mean, we all are to, to some uh, who are senior researchers, but I think I may have the luxury to carve out a little bit more uh, time uh, sometimes when I need to focus. And I think that that's one of the, the trickiest part. And this sort of uh, lack of protected time is also a, a driver for, for brain, drain, brain drain partially to NGOs and to institutions abroad. Um, I think also because you're involved in so many different projects as a senior researcher, project aims and deliverables often overlap, which can cause some frustration in terms of who, who owns a certain sort of research question or, or, or data where, where there can sometimes be misunderstandings that are, it's easy to understand why this occurs, but I think it has to do a little bit with overcommitment. Again, uh, obviously showing that we need many more to be trained and with PhDs who can lead uh, large research projects. Uh, we also have administrative challenges. Uh, there's so many, so much bureaucracy and administration that goes into, for example, EU uh, funded projects. And we need to invest much more time into uh, training staff uh, and on, on admin issues and also connect, make networks of administrators. And it's actually something that uh, I've initiated in the EDCDP projects that I've been part of or, or led. And I think this is uh, very much appreciated and something we can learn from more from. Uh, needless to say, there is an issue with attitudes uh, where money often talks. And I think this is a problem not only for European researchers, but also North American uh, researchers that when you come in with money, you sort of uh, behave as if you own the issues and should invent the research questions while the research questions obviously should stem from the countries where the research is, is performed and data is, is collected. And I think that this has historically created unequal partnerships that uh, in a way that is not optimal uh, for anyone really and uh, that needs to be improved. Uh, I think we also need to realize that there is a lack of understanding uh, and interest among funders of health issues that are less prevalent within uh, Europe and in high income settings uh, at among European uh, politicians in particular who sort of initiate these funding grants. Uh, it's become very obvious uh, of how nationalism uh, and sort of tunneling has uh, really uh, dominated policies and lack of solidarity and knowledge transfer during the COVID pandemic. I think it's obvious to all. So there we have a lot to work on. Uh, something that is close to my heart and very worrisome is, our, is the, the long-term consequence of the school closures. How can we repair this huge loss in human capacity and capital in particular uh, in Africa? Some opportunities then, um, I mean, the COVID crisis has revealed huge gaps uh, in coordination and uh, it's obvious that the mandate of WHO and global agencies is too weak to really coordinate uh, pandemic preparedness, but also other uh, global health issues. Uh, we, we need to strengthen uh, collaborative and, and uh, coordination. It's also obvious to all that we have an unsustainable dependency on very few vaccine and pharma manufacturers and that needs to be uh, and regions need to be more self-sufficient in this uh, vaccine uh, uh, production, for example, needs to be scaled up to to more regions and areas in the world. There's also been an obvious lack of knowledge transfer and solidarity with the very one disease oriented narrow nationalistic perspective that hasn't uh, at all benefited the world's uh, uh, response to the pandemic. All of this, I think, has actually created a window of opportunity, though, and an insight that global leaderships and solutions are necessary to fight the global uh, infection and other infectious diseases as well that, that cross borders. 
and I think we see, uh, or I, I do see a very strong and accelerated interest into surveillance, uh, disease surveillance, health surveillance, data sharing, and actually research collaboration at the very new level with huge data sets and a lot of researchers sort of uh, establishing new networks where our politicians fail to collaborate. I see that researchers do so across borders, and I think this is actually very promising. Uh, we also, this is also an opportunity for long-term investments into research and development and health systems um, strengthening that, uh, to sort of say that this is necessary for global resilience, but also for equity and more equal access to, to global goods, including vaccines and uh, drugs. So uh, my advice would be to make more time for grant applications if, if possible, and sort of really understand that yet you need to, to devote months to actually get the EDCP grants, and we need to make that time available to work together uh, to send in applications, because once you actually submit, uh, chances of getting them are, are not that, that small. Uh, EU also partners with the African Union on this, for example, on, on the new strategy. Uh, we need to scale up lobbying to funding agencies and our own national and regional politicians to promote uh, and prioritize this sort of collaboration and make funding available. Uh, we also need to build more administrative capacity, uh, including financial reporting capacity, to manage these grants and become attractive partners in collaboration. And uh, I would like to, you know, see even more ownership from southern partners in coming up with the research questions, in, in owning the projects for mutual win-win relationships, and realize the power uh, that you have, actually, that the, day, the your data is the new gold, and you are the ones that should set the agenda and drive uh, new research projects according to the priorities that you feel should be there and should be prioritized the health issues that are most important uh, to your countries and i would be very happy to uh, be part of that and support that sort of development even more uh, in the future thank you so much for taking your time to listen so thank you uh very much professor anna uh, for your insight how the western world could support more Edu uh, education through South-South cooperation. Uh, the example of Sweden is really uh, an example that is very classical. All the obstacles you have uh, pointed out uh, exist everywhere, and in some countries it is even worse. Uh, when you say that um, uh, researcher and faculty in the global south doesn't own. They doesn't own because the research brings to them almost nothing than to collect and to do research for publication, but they have to do that on top of the work they are doing to own their life. When in the north, people, it is include in the work of the people because they can leave out of the money for the research what Africa for example, cannot do. I have some grants where it say you can do the research, but you cannot be pay your time by through that research. So I have to do that on top of what I'm doing, while the partners in the US are pay out of that for their time. So there is a lot of administrative approaches that have to be changed if we want to the the uh, the uh, global north to really support the development of the south south cooperation and knowing that the south south cooperation is needed for us to uh, really accelerate our development uh, and also uh, you have give a lot of good ideas uh, but you have said something is that the people who come with the money uh, lead the agenda so you want more ownership, but ownership has a cost uh, that the money uh, of research doesn't buy. So those are really great questions to debate and change of mindset. So uh, it complements also the crab story that uh, Professor Pascale told us. But there is a lot of hope now we are going to listen to Dr. Kate Martin, 
who will be presenting about the role of uh, the Consortium of University of Global Health in improving education by supporting South-South cooperation. Kate, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Dr. Keith Martin and I'm the Executive Director of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health here in Washington, DC. It's a pleasure to join you today and for my job is to discuss the role of the U.S. in improving education by supporting South-South cooperation. And I'd like to thank Professor Benawaho for allowing me to join you on this important webinar. We know education is absolutely critically important for any country to be able to advance and to be able to move forward on a path of prosperity and stability. So how can we do a better job of doing that? Well, let's take a look at some possible ideas. Well, Dr. Binawa asked me to look at sort of four areas, the situation in Africa, share with you some information on the topic, some best practices or not so good practices by the United States, and how we can improve forward some solutions to improving education in Africa. Well, first, the situation. Well, a lot has changed and a lot has improved over many years, but still the continent has some of the poorest education outcomes in the world. And there's a number of reasons for this. Teachers often have poor training, low pay, the morale is often poor, and the work conditions are often uh, inadequate. For the students, the two primary reasons why they don't attend school are one, health, and the second, economics. They can't pay and can, cannot afford to attend school. Public financing across many countries on the continent is relatively low for education. There are multiple infrastructure deficits, including a lack of electricity, water, and sanitation, and children need those kind of conditions to be able to learn anywhere. And also the digital divide is significant across the continent. Access to affordable broadband is often very limited, as are the uh, infrastructure necessary for people to learn online educational products, and in fact, access to libraries. Most schools in Africa don't have a library. There's also a need not only to strengthen primary and secondary school, but also universities and skills trades. An interesting point, Switzerland, which has a relatively low university graduation rate, has a very low unemployment rate, but has a very robust set of skilled trade schools that people go to and are employed. Migration and the poaching of trained professionals by high-income countries is deeply unethical and robs low-income countries of their best and brightest. There's often also a lack of alignment between training capacity and the needs of economies, and there are insufficient mechanisms, quite frankly, for North-South and South-South collaboration. There's a lot of information on the topic and how to move forward, and I've shared with you a number of those uh, options uh, here. Uh, UNESCO has a lot of products that I encourage you to take a look at, um, from data for sustainable development goals uh, to other products. USAID has a lot of products. There's actually a UN office for South-South collaboration. And a new uh, academy at the World Health Organization is currently being stood up called the WHO Academy. And that will provide a lot of uh, free and open access products for people to, uh, to utilize. U.S. best practices and bad practices, well, this can be said of any uh, uh, country, but I will share with you that the United States in 2019, uh, they reached uh, and provided um, uh, assistance for more than 32 million children in 51 countries around the world. Uh, they also provided professional development for over half a million teachers and administrators uh, worldwide. So I take a look at what they've been uh, been doing. Uh, and by focusing also on equity, inclusion, and marginalized, they're prioritizing the training of girls, the marginalized, and ensuring that there's inclusion and equity for girls and boys in their training programs. Uh, when things go badly, there's a failure to listen to countries, a failure to empower countries to lead their programs, uh, to ensure that the investments are not primarily utilized by high-income countries, but really accrue to and are used by low-income countries. 
So importantly, let's look at some solutions. Well, building South-South partnerships across sectors and between academia, public and private sectors is important. There's a vital importance to identify the skills needed by employers and align those with the training capacity of countries. Strengthening public ministries, not only in education, but also in infrastructure, finance, and health. That creates the, the platform on which any country needs to be able to have if they're going to operationalize the programs in education or anything else necessary to be able to manage and deliver those public goods. Middle and high income countries um, are, are often repositories of funds stolen from low income countries and have not been often implementing the anti corruption measures necessary. Corruption um, takes away 10 times the amount of money in official development assistance. So over $1.5 trillion is stolen from low income countries and other countries worldwide. Uh, that robs countries of their ability to pay for public goods like education. So middle and high income countries need to work with low income countries to deal with the issue of corruption, which erodes and it really is a cancer in development and undermines uh, countries from within. So that's been particularly damaging to low income countries and high income countries have been the beneficiaries of the theft of these funds. There's a vital importance to improve teacher training and certification improve pay and working conditions. Students remove uh, uh, school fees and, and if, where possible, if kids can have school meals, uh, this is critical in a child's ability to, um, to develop uh, soundly. The malnutrition actually has a profound, prolonged damaging effect on the cognitive capabilities of children. We know that. School meals and micronutrient supplementation are really uh, uh, value, high value ways to improve a child's ability to learn. Using data and evidence to drive investments um, and investing, as I said, uh, across primary, secondary universities and both skilled trades and vocational trades. Access to infrastructure, 3G, is critically important. We cannot talk about um, uh, online learning unless the issue of the digital divide is dealt with. So we need to work collaboratively to ensure that uh, the continent, the African continent, uh, has access to affordable quality uh, 3G uh, broadband. I'd like to thank you very much uh, for, your, for your time. Um, there are a lot of solutions here and we at CUGH would love to work with you to be able to, um, to uh, strengthen education uh, not only across Africa, but across other parts of the world where there are enormous gaps in access to quality education. Thank you for your time, and back to you, Dr. Binawaho. Thank you very much, Dr. Kate, for this recall of the role of the Consortium of University of Global Health uh, across that concern university uh, that have a global health program across the world. Uh, what you do for improving and supporting South-South cooperation. I uh, want also to thank all the panelists because we have seen the challenges in all different institutions, in African Union, example of what happened in Europe, what happened in the Consortium of Global Health Equity, and also uh, what happened uh, in the United Nations and uh, the organization where uh, Professor Pascale is, wait, is working. So we have got challenges, but we have got also solutions and way forward. So now um, I uh, want to, to remind all the participants that the audience that you can send your question to the chat. And all the questions that will not be answered during the panel, the, the, the webinar, will be answered by the speaker uh, the question is directed to, and I will post those answers through Twitter, Instagram with the hashtag Ask Prof. Agnes. So don't hesitate, send your question, they will all be answered. Let's now uh, dive into the Q&A. Uh, there is already some uh, question here we have received uh, before. Professor Pascale, I will direct to you my first question. 
the agenda to decolonize global health. Uh, in particular, uh, as it related to the generation of knowledge, whether through research or higher education, seems to be largely colonized by institutions in the global north. This is a challenge that seems to call for cooper better cooperation across higher education institutions in the global south to know how to uh, uh, stop. How can we reclaim the issue in order to forge our own path to the decolonized global health agenda? Professor Pascale. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, just so just to um, really emphasize that the, the um, point that I was trying to make through the, the anecdote is that we need to for, for cooperation to occur effectively, we need to have the enabling environment to allow that cooperation to happen. Um, and it's very clear. I mean, I, 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 I am not I'm not. Um, reactionary, and, and I'm not so. The, the point is is not that we should not be engaging with the global north. I think that we've um, raised issues, and I think um, um, Anna Maria has also outlined quite a few of the challenges that are clear in that um, north south power relationship. So I won't dwell on that too much. What I really want us, what what I really want to to kind of highlight is what is stopping us really within the global south from cooperating as better than uh, the way that we do now. Um, and I think it, it, it's, there are a number of things. One is that very often in the issue of cooperation, we assume that we're all on the same page. So even if the outcome that we want is a similar one, we still need to engage properly with each other to understand that even, even across Africa, the different countries have different pressures and different touch points. The different institutions have different pressures and touch points. You've raised some, um, and yes, yourself with the with the issues of whether whether you you have the funding for your salary as well as the funding for the research and so on. So when we're trying to cooperate, we need to really think of internally about what some of the issues are possibly with our institutions that we need to work through in order to ensure that we can cooperate better. Um, we need to understand that cooperation for some is transactional um, with expected reciprocation and with some it's about values. And so in, in that negotiation of how we cooperate together with each other, we need to think about the value creation part of it. Um, the, the partners need to understand what they get individually, but actually what the collaborative advantage is in coming together. We really need to work on our governance and accountability. Um, a, co a cooperation um, agreement has um, accountability that is mutual. Both parties need to, to be accountable for what it is they engage and, and they expect from the partnership. And some of the governance issues are really, really problematic. Um, we, that we have some good examples, as you've said, um, uh, and, and as have been raised um, generally. I mean, like the, the, the Carter Consortium, for instance, for uh, research training, really thinks about um, the, the issues. It's an opportunity for each country and each of the, the, the partners involved to think about the issues within their own countries and bring that together. And there is a, a spirit of learning associated with it and so on. But I really do, I guess the, the really important point is that we need to clean up our own house and be very clear about how it is we cooperate better so that it's mutually, it, it is, there, there is mutual gain across the board. Thank you. Thank you uh, for answering that. And I believe that, um, we all here believe that we need to strengthen South-South uh, cooperation because it's a missed opportunity, you know? I don't say that we need to cancel no South or any East South, et cetera, other cooperation. It's something that we didn't promote enough. 
And the period of COVID where travel were, uh, tra I can travel easily to Kenya, et cetera, but I cannot travel easily to some part of the world. It's also far, et cetera, and we have knowledge to share. So this is how uh, we, we see it at uh, the University of Global Health Equity. Don't cancel, add, and use what you have. Like uh, that's what we have to Anamia and to Kate. How can we use what you do to promote an additional South-South cooperation that it's needed? Um, so thank you, uh, Pascale, to point this out. So my ne next um, uh, question uh, goes to you, uh, Professor Abdelatif. Uh, the effort of uh, Africa in response to COVID have been so far more successful than what we believe, what we were, ex what was expecting. Uh, our African country are containing even without having access to vaccine. Only uh, uh, three percent of African, uh, the African population, is vaccinated now. However, most of the collaborative effort have been shown in the health sector. Uh, how can African countries expand this collaboration in the education sector? So if we have succeeded more in the health sector, thanks to CDC Africa and African Union, by the way, how can we now uh, expand this type of collaboration to the education sector? The floor is yours, uh, Professor Abdelatif. Thank you, Professor Anis. To answer your pertinent question, I must share some of the considerable efforts of the African Union member states provided in 2020 and 2021 regarding the continuity of education for all leaders with a high focus on gender and other vulnerable groups. So in April 2020, immediately after the announcement of COVID-19 in most African countries and the statement of the ministers of education to close the schools, the higher schools and the universities. So the uh, specialized technical committee of African Union on Education, Science and Technology uh, met and uh, with the participation of all its members the economic regions and uh, the development partners for evaluating the impact of COVID-19 on the education and for undertaking the main strategies necessary to tackle the burning issues. As main resolutions from the first meeting, so the Commission for Education, Science, Technology and Innovation, led by Her Excellency Professor Anion uh, Agbor, urge the member states to lobby for increased national budget for education, science, technology, and innovation. Also, she acknowledged the role and welcomed the offers by development partners to collaborate with African Indian to roll out programs to ensure continuity of learning based on dots. So this big program is uh, a program developed with uh, partners and concerns digital connectivity, online learning teachers as facilitators, safety online, and skilled focused learning. Uh, since this date, many meetings with the ministers of education, science, and technology have been organized for discussing the issue of uh, COVID-19 and how we can uh, find urgent solutions, knowing that this continent is very different from the others. The heterogeneity in this continent is very big. So you can have a country without giving any names. So you have a country facing the challenge of internet quality as the request was too high and uh, unprecedented. And you have another country uh, with another challenge to uh, offer electricity access. 
So uh, we try at least to harmonize and to offer also some common platforms uh, with full access in some uh, African countries. So many efforts uh, have been provided uh, last year and this year uh, to tackle the issues of COVID-19, but we have to recognize Professor Agnes uh, the urgent need also to uh, focus on the quality of education as the impact will uh, continue at least in the next two decades. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your answer. And also, I think that uh, uh, what we can do, uh, Professor Abdelati, for and for all the speakers as well, uh, is to uh, for you to share uh, you, um, uh, Professor Pascale, Dr. Keith, and uh, Professor Namia, to share where all those information can be tackled by people who are, um, uh, want to have them uh, so that we share your website or the website you will indicate to, to us um, and send that to all the people who have registered. Uh, for this webinar. It will be very useful because it's a lot of information. Uh, Professor Anamia, the next question is for you. What are the main benefits of the Sandwich PhD program that SIDA has sponsored between Swedish and research in the South? Uh, and uh, this I'm sure it's uh, somebody who think about resistance. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, when I was uh, working in the health sector, uh, this channel has helped us to have a great PhD uh, owner, well-educated in, in area that was useful for us. So the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Professor Binawao. Uh, I think the sandwich program for CEDA that it has supported uh, PhD education in uh, Uganda and Tanzania, uh, for example, for many decades. And the idea is that you get a PhD both at Karolinska Institute and your home university. And you have uh, supervisors at both universities or both institutions, both in your home country and in Sweden. And to prevent uh, brain drain uh, and to offer protected time and what you very well expressed uh, the ownership issue is very much that you, you don't get your research time paid for. Uh, and uh, that is actually part of this program that you get set your salary paid for and, uh, and a per diem during the months when you, when you are in Sweden, which is a couple of months per year. The rest of the time you can carry on with your research, your clinical research and your responsibilities at home. Uh, so that, and, and as we have seen, there hasn't been, this has not contributed to any, any of these uh, African colleagues actually moving to Sweden after their PhDs, or, or uh, uh, but they stay at home because they, they carry out the research at home and all the important tasks you have as a, a family member, a teacher, a clinician, all of that. So uh, to me, this is a, a, a good actually example of how it can be done. Uh, so that you take courses at your home university, help, help with teaching, but also get some protected time uh, support and supervision. And then you also meet your South South colleagues when you are in Sweden, because since we have so many colleagues from the South, you, you tend to meet other researchers and can tie bonds with them also during your visits on our joint research group webinars, for example. I can't hear you now. Yeah, I was on mute. I muted myself because of the wind here. <laughs> I didn't want. So thank you. It's uh, it's uh, it's useful and it's a good good model for other university who really want to help low and middle income countries uh, to uh, increase the number of very uh, knowledgeable and skilled professional, uh, former future teachers, etc., uh, to create and transfer skills without promoting brain drain, uh, what is uh, um, a, a very good model. So um, Dr. Kate, the next question is for you. 
As the executive director of CUGH, the Consortium of University of Global Health, uh, how has the pandemic affected CUGH work? And is uh, CUGH partnering with other stakeholders to help university members to respond effectively to the pandemic? So this is an interesting question as we have said how heavily COVID has impacted uh, uh, the education sector. Uh, Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Benoit. Well, you just laid out a central challenge and an opportunity that we have. And you're absolutely correct. The pandemic has affected all of us. It's affected our ability to work, get together, uh, collaborate. And certainly from an education perspective, we've heard how devastating it has been for everybody. But of course, more so than uh, those living in low and middle income countries by far. Um, I think that from our perspective, we see this as an enormous opportunity to move forward and reform global health because global health, let's say it, is not equitable and has not been equitable for, it's not equitable and has not been equitable. So the question for us is at CUJH is what are we doing to be able to change that? And what we have been doing for quite a few years, and I wanna thank you, Professor Benoit, because you're part of our ability to decolonize global health as co-leading that effort with our chair, um, Dr. Barry from Stanford. Um, so we're working on a number of things. Number one, on the advocacy issue, we have been fighting hard for vaccine equity to, in, to fight for ensuring that, that uh, the individuals living in LMICs are gonna be able to get the vaccines they need. It is not acceptable in any way, shape or form. We'd all agree that the high income countries get the vaccines and the low income countries do not. So we're trying to change that by fighting hard for vaccine equity. Uh, we're advocating for how we do global health, ensuring that LMIC leaders are at the heart of what we do at CUGH. For example, we have an annual conference. At the heart of our conference, coming up next year, and I'd encourage you to take a look at cugh2022.org, is the leadership of AfriHealth, the African Forum for Research and Education Health, located in Kumasi, Ghana. Also, Brack University in Bangladesh. So we're bringing together individuals from LMICs and individuals in high-income countries to collaborate together as equals to be able to reform the whole institution of global global health. We've created opportunities for, for um, uh, listening to our colleagues uh, as we are guided by our colleagues in, in LMICs. What do you need? So in capacity building, we have a dedicated uh, committee for capacity building and we're working on mental health in West Africa, nursing training. Uh, uh, to also, we have a program advisory service for LMICs, a mechanism in our research committee to be able to to train and strengthen uh, the capacity of um, LMIC students to be able to have better um, uh, um, abstracts. And we've changed, and I can tell you today, the announcements today, our conference next year is now going to go completely virtual. It's not going to be an in-person, recognizing the obstacles that exist for our colleagues in LMICs to be able to participate in our work and our commitment to ensuring that we remove as many obstacles as possible so we can work uh, as uh, collectively with colleagues around the world. And finally, we, I have to say that all of us have mentioned a number, numerous challenges, but numerous opportunities. We have a moment in time to reform global health. It is not acceptable that we go back to business as usual. We have to reform the sector. If we don't, it will be entirely hypocritical. But there are chances to work collectively together, collaboratively together for mutual uh, goals. But uh, it has, the system has to reform in so many ways. And we can get back into that later on, if you wish, Professor Benoit. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kate. It's clear. Post-COVID cannot be uh, like before COVID, if not that we are, we are really not serious. It's a tragedy, a challenge, a nightmare, but at least we have to take the opportunity to improve the business we are doing in our field. You are right. Uh, and you are right also that uh, you, Professor Anamia, Professor 
uh, Abdelatif and uh, Professor Pascale have shared the type of opportunity that exists and that we should say more and amplify and repeat and, and emulate uh, so that we can uh, go to the third crab basket of uh, Professor Pascale. So um, the next question is for you, uh, our host, Eugène. Uh, as we have noted, the COVID-19 crisis has had tremendous effect on the education system. Uh, I know that also because you are uh, mentoring some students that are students now as the Alumni Council. Uh, could you please share with us the critically important role higher education institutions play in addressing this unprecedented effect. The floor is yours, Eugène. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Pinabo, for the lead in this webinar. I think so far it has been uh, very informative on how we are doing with this South-South uh, uh, co collaboration or cooperation to develop our nations. I think COVID-19 have taught us that we are one world. And as such, one thing I see the higher education institutions should do to address the effects of these unprecedented uh, effects will be, first of all, to uh, review, document what worked well. I think, as you saw in the beginning of COVID-19, every country was trying its own measures Every community was trying to do their own solution or response. But one thing that we need to look at is the preparedness. How are we prepared even before even this COVID ends? Are we ready for another wave? What are we doing to avoid it? So the, 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 the higher education should continue to leverage the use of technology. I think technology has been one of the tools that actually helped us uh, to keep moving. And that was in terms of even educating the, the students who are still at school during the lockdowns, sharing the course materials. But also one thing that I saw was the inequity because not everyone had access to internet, not everyone had a computer. So as such, we need to continue to research how we can actually use the technology to reach the, the least uh, amongst us. How do we help the communities to actually know that there is a disease coming up or measures of prevention? And also the higher education can also continue to, to do uh, research, I think. Although all the systems have been tested, but also research have been tested. You find the higher education research is done, uh, students graduate, but the follow up to use the findings of those research remain uh, a challenge. So I think uh, we need the universities uh, to collaborate, have shared, uh, shared platforms, of course, share also resources. And in a way, I may even suggest that we should have funds to compete for, which would encourage young researchers to do some uh, work and find solutions. And this will help us to respond to the current and also to other diseases. I, th I think there are still diseases taking silent uh, lives today which have not really uh, got the attention as COVID did, but we still need to, to work on them. So I think although the world has several actors, the education is still at the heart. So without uh, a proper working system in education, I think we really, really have an ending cycle of such events. And lastly, I think the higher education should also work with the policymakers 
because they need us, they need the scientific world. Although we saw initially the politicians resisting the scientific world, but it is inevitable science will govern. So we need to continue to do the advocacy towards policymakers. Thank you, um, Eugène, for uh, this response. And you are right, but we maybe also uh, have to think about, be careful of competition because we can reach the, the basket number one uh, that uh, Professor Pascale has shown us. We should find a way maybe uh, to promote research uh, for each and everyone at work. There are so many research we can do at work, nurses, nutritionists, agronomists, etc., for understanding better what we do and how to do it better. And we should all to get maybe try to find fun for that uh, because they will bring knowledge that will help all the world. Um, the other thing you say also make me think about the fact that today Africa is running for manufacturing uh, medicine tools and vaccine. And we realize that the human resources are missing because we didn't educate in the field that are relevant to have this type of professionals. So uh, you are right. Decision makers, university have to come together to discuss better together how to produce what we need for our development. So, uh, and in that field also South-South collaboration can be good because we have some countries that are advanced like South Africa, some country who have some great le uh, legal framework like Ghana, country that are already advanced also like Egypt. We can put together those knowledge and serve all the other countries of the continent. Very promising. Uh, Professor Pascale, I'm coming back to you with a question about gender. Asking, is there a role for gender equality agenda in promoting South-South cooperation? I would have to say absolutely. You know me, Agnes, this is something that I'm always very excited about. Um, I think, um, so if, if there are a number of ways of, of thinking about it. One is if there's a lot, there is a lot we have to learn um, from the leadership that we've seen um, throughout the COVID um, pandemic. We know, we know, and this is, this is through the, the it, it is evident um, that where the, the strongest cooperation has happened, that is absolutely has been required to manage the pandemic and so on. It has come from female leaders and we know from the evidence on um, different leadership styles and so on that um, women are more likely to be um, collaborative um, in, their, in, in, in the way that they interact with and deal with conflict. Um, so clearly, I think there, there, there are some just general lessons that need to be brought to the field to, to look at what feminist cooperation would look like um, and how we can, we can embody some of those um, principles in the way that we think about the notion of cooperation. And it is, it really is about, I, I think the, 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 it is, we really do need to strengthen how it is we work with each other, with all of the values and everything that go with that um, because it is a crit it is an absolutely critical part of being the crabs in 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 three in uh, box three um, that that we know how to work together. The other thing is as well, and it's I'm really uh, delighted to see that this is becoming uh, this, the, it has been part of some of the discussions at the UN General Assembly and so on. That there is there is a much stronger now move move towards actually thinking about what it is we mean when we keep talking about women in leadership. That it is not. It is not simply about putting um, um, more women in and of itself, but what that means. And it's not just changing the kind of person, replacing one with the other, but it also it's also giving us the opportunity to think about the systems and structures of of how we operate 
um, how we engage and so on, and actually think about how we change those sorts of things as well. So I'd like to see um, uh, really, uh, given we're talking about higher education, I think much more engagement in, in understanding the evidence of how um, gender equality actually changes, not just the ticking the boxes of different numbers, but how it qualitatively, qualitatively changes the nature of our institutions and the way we that the way that we work together as well. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Pascale. And it's so true. You know why? Because culturally, in our village, our communities, high education, even if it's open to girls and women. There are many families who are against because the dedication of a woman is to be married and to produce children and to take care about the home. And this is one of the major obstacles that uh, through other sectors, other sectors we really need to, um, to challenge. Uh, like we have only 10% of graduate MDs in, in a country that promote gender equity like Rwanda, who are doctors, you know? Nurses, no problem, plenty. Mm -hmm. Doctors, only 10%. And that's why at the University of Global Health Equity, as a statement, we recruit 70% of girls in our medical education by principle. So we, we go for the 70% bet, the best, and we take the 30% the best boys or men. Just a statement for gender equity, but it should be done everywhere because gender equity is not gender equality. Gender equity is really to challenge the gap that exists and create the balance for recovery, to recover the gap. So thank you very much. Um, the next question is for you, Professor Abdelatif. How can the concept of Pan-African University further contribute to South-South cooperation? Thank you, Professor uh, Agnes. The Pan-African University is the co culmination of continental initiatives of the Commission of the African uh, Union to revitalize higher education and research in Africa under the second decade of education for Africa and the consolidated plan of action of science and technology for Africa. This university has been launched in 2012. And today we have four institutes operating in the continent and the fifth one will be launched soon in South Africa. So there is one institute for each uh, regional economic uh, and uh, the four institutes are located today in uh, Kenya, Nigeria, Cameroon, Algeria, and uh, the rectorate moved since two years from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia to Yaoundé in Cameroon. And around this uh, university, so we implemented also the virtual Pan-African University, which is more dedicated for uh, learning or distance learning uh, uh, education today. And we succeeded to graduate uh, today uh, for more than uh, 40 African Union state members. So the, we are covering uh, 49 African countries. Most of African countries are represented. For each institute, there is a key thematic partner. So uh, for the help in Algeria, we are working with the Germany uh, in the help of uh, Kenya. So uh, we are working, we are collaborating with the Japan, uh, Sweden also for Cameroon and, uh, and India for Nigeria. And the help in South Africa, will be supported by US and also European Union. So some other partners also uh, came to the university and we started the first uh, collaborations uh, like South Korea 
uh, like South Korea, Turkey, and Iran. There is uh, a very high also employability as success indicator of this university. So in Algeria, we reach more than 80% uh, after four years of operating and how we have a strong network of universities, academia, and research institutions in the continent and elsewhere. So today, the Pan-African University uh, and any cooperation with this university can open the door for all this big network. We started also some negotiations with some universities in Latin America, in Asia, and we are open so for uh, negotiating in a cooperation that could be offered in the, the, the near future. So uh, the, the main objectives also of the university is to uh, equip the Africans uh, by world-class university that can allow uh, the, the, the talented youth Africans to have participate in the implementation of Agenda 2063. So this is the pillar of this uh, Pan-African University. So uh, I think uh, the time is too short. Uh, it will remain available uh, by email uh, for exchanging and also for sharing any needed data. And if there is also any uh, cooperation, so we, we are open. Uh, as said, Colin Powers, we cannot expect better future without cooperation. So, and the cooperation South-South is a very learning process and we believe to it. So thank you once again. Uh, thank you, Professor Abdelati. Uh, this is the type of cooperation that will increase the institutional capacity to give um, quality education. What is uh, a, a, another portion of increasing the quality of the people through education? Uh, or, yeah, so, and it's very important because this is sustainability. One, the institution has that, many Africans will benefit from that. So what we can do, Professor Abdelaziz, for all those information, I repeat, you will tell us which, where they can be found and we will share uh, all what you have shared with us, Professor Pascale, Dr. Kate, and Professor Anna as well, and, uh, uh, and Eugène. We will share that with the participant or those who have uh, registered to this uh, webinar. So that it's uh, because it's a lot of information. Even if they take notes, they're not uh, they are not quick enough. I I swear too much. So uh, the next question is back to you, Professor Anna Mia. Uh, giving the example of Sweden, how have uh, you have presented to us earlier? Can you expand on what is your recommendation on how to increase country country exchange in knowledge sharing, sharing of experience, and good practice, policy, technology, and resource? And also, I will ask you how you link that to increasing South South cooperation. The floor is yours, uh, Professor Anamia. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think I would I would like to to build that uh, the answer a little bit on what uh, my colleagues here in the panel have said and also uh, uh, what you have pointed out before in terms of of uh, the problem of actually having senior researchers supporting uh, the young ones, which I think is to build institutional capacity, and and, and there I, building both on what Eugene Sangano said and Professor Abdullahi. On, on the African virtual university. I think the digital revolution sort of what is really the only good thing that has come out of the last horrible one and a half years is actually that we are using digital tools much more. And I think that is a way to actually increase collaboration much more and accelerate this because traveling has been very expensive and difficult. Sometimes the absurdity of West African colleagues having to go, go via Europe to meet in East Africa. You know, it, it is really making very few very few can actually meet then. So I think using this actually is a good thing. Um, 
but also uh, make also what has been said before very wisely by my colleagues, making sure that uh, African researchers get to implement the research findings, for example, after your master thesis or a PhD thesis. And that does require senior researchers to actually support the younger colleagues. And going back to the crab basket uh, uh, story, uh, I think senior researchers should not see uh, actually that they have to sacrifice themselves to support younger researchers, but at the opposite, on the opposite, this is your silver, the silver lining of your career, you know, that you see that you've reached your position where you uh, has to have the opportunity to support your younger colleagues and that will, that should make you very proud that you have reached this position and also your legacy, uh, the way you will be remembered will have, you know, be influenced by this. And that includes giving your female colleagues a chance to grow, even the senior ones that have had a very difficult time during their uh, careers. So th that's how you build, you know, and support each other and, and yourselves. But to, to, to end, I think I see that actually happening. I think the younger generation is much, much better uh, than it was only 10, 20 years ago. I see in the EDPCTP projects that I'm part of, which are PI'd and coordinated by Ugandan institution, by UVRI, with, uh, it, they drive the whole thing, you know, they, they in, start webinars, they have workshops. Uh, it's truly South-South uh, collaboration where the Northern partners have play a much, much smaller role, really, you know, and uh, I, I, it's just, it's happening. It's, it's coming now. And, and I, I think this is, yes, we've only seen the beginning of it, but I'm hopeful. We are old, that's why we are here. <laughs> and that's why you have been invited, because even if we highlight challenges, it's just to, hi to, 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 to bring that to the mind of everybody and to start working on it. But uh, uh, we are all uh, full of hope. That's how we do the work we do every day. And also, this is how we, I, I strongly believe that South South will, is the is the solution to to really leapfrog. However, we need the support of the traditional uh, partnership that has to be more uh, respectful and provide more ownership uh, yes. to each partners. So thank you, Kate. Uh, a question for you. Uh, we are at the end of uh, 2018 20. 21 uh, CUGH strategic goal and metrics with the mission to improve the well being of people and the planet through education, research, service, and advocacy. Can you tell us some of the achievements of uh, CUGH contributing to the promotion of South South cooperation? Well, uh, merci beaucoup, and yes, uh, there's a, a few things that we have done, but I'd like to focus on the path forward, if I may because that's where we need to go. So building on the work we've done on creating platforms, our relationship with AfroHealth and CUGH, we have a working group with them. Our conferences are all embedded with leadership from low to middle income countries. Our committees and research groups all have leadership from LMICs embedded in the direction of where those are going. But I just wanna focus on moving forward to deal with the persistent structural inequities in research. And here's three things that I would challenge all of my colleagues in high income countries to do. One is to share your curriculum. It is unacceptable that you hoard that curriculum and don't share it. Second, access to your libraries. You're working with colleagues in LMICs. Share your libraries. There's no reason why you cannot do that. As I mentioned in my comments, and uh, Professor Lottie knows this as well, better than probably anybody, that so many of our colleagues in low-income countries just simply don't have access to it. We're working with a colleague right now in Sierra Leone. People in, probably may not know, you, you all know, but there's only two psychiatrists in Sierra Leone, right? Three nurses in Sierra Leone, a country that went, came out of a horrible series of conflicts and the Ebola outbreak. So we're working with him to be able to strengthen um, mental health care capacity in his country, but he doesn't have access to a library or access to journals. So high income country colleagues, you're working with colleagues in LMICs, enable them to get access to your libraries and journals for free. Third, provide trainers as directed by your colleagues in LMICs. What we know in education is that is that long-term collaboration, this is clearly a two-way street. We're all gonna learn from each other. 
from these relationships. But ongoing support and, and that those relationships and professional support over a prolonged period of time will see the professional cohorts and retain the professional cohorts within uh, those countries. And as we do that collaboratively, we'll need to do that. I know our colleagues are not incentivized to do this in high-income countries, and that's perhaps a question for another day. But this it's all what I mentioned is within our power to do it and may involve breaking some eggs and challenging your own institutions. But for heaven's sakes, if we're not doing that in global health, where are we going to do that? So I challenge all of our colleagues to, to those are three hard and fast concrete actions you can take now. And we at CUGH are working with our LMIC partners, including Professor Benawaho and, and uh, others, including uh, Professor Extra, uh, Anna Maria, um, and colleagues around the world and across uh, Africa. And I just draw attention to AfroHealth in Kumasi, Ghana. Take a look at the African Forum for Research and Education Health. They're in Kumasi, Ghana, doing fantastic work. Please follow them uh, and, uh, and join them in their efforts. So thank you, Professor Banawaho, for this opportunity. And at CUGH, we look forward to working with all of you in our common mission. Let's say this, Kate and uh, Professor uh, Abdelatif and uh, uh, Pascali. Let's go for a common uh, statement for our constituency to move in that direction. You got it? Kate, you are going to draft it, we are going to enrich it, and we are going to disseminate it. Uh, those who we are all together because this is a call for action. And also, we can monitor who is doing it. Uh, the true global health fighters or the bureaucrat that are sitting somewhere and pretend to do global health. We are going to challenge them and follow them. And Eugène, you'll be the one following it up for all of us with your alumni uh, council. It can be a follow-up action that you take on and you inform all of us here. The, we are at the end. There's still a lot of questions there. I know that uh, Eugène has collected the question through the Alumni Council. Um, the, the team has collected questions for all of you. I can just say thank you to all our panelists and participants for attending this informative conversation and for using this webinar platform to acknowledge the effort of south south cooperation in education that has already go uh, are already ongoing and what we can do more uh, to uh, develop this tool for development and uh, uh, for the call of action that has been given here we always look forward to using a collective voice to advocate for global health equity, especially in response to COVID effects in crucial areas like education, health, and among uh, the vulnerable more than uh, everything. Uh, this will help the Global South to come up better equipped to update post-pandemic education structure and uh, more partnership, North, uh, south, but especially South-South, all based on ownership and on mutual respect. We have a call for action here. Everybody on this panel have uh, a task to do, and we will take you uh, informed. Thank you uh, to Eugène Sangano, the Executive Director of Alliance for Healthy Communities, who as the chair of the UJG Alumni Council has hosted us. Uh, we highly commend the council effort to in practicing what they have learned and build for build a world more just. And I'm very pleased that Eugène has agreed on your behalf to follow this call for action. We are all going to uh, do now and publish through our uh, media and platform. The webinar recording will be disseminated on UJG channel very shortly. All the questions that has been collected will be answered using the hashtag Prof. Agnes on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook by the speaker they are directed to. And this brings today's session to the end. I wish all of you a nice time, whatever place you are participating from. And I look forward to seeing you again to the next month's House Prof. Agnes Equity Webinar, which will be inspired by the World Food Day. 
which is celebrated next month. Thank you, Professor Pascale, Professor Namia, Professor Admiratif, and Dr. Kate and Eugene. It was great. Thank you also to the technical team that has allowed me to, to run this webinar so smoothly because they are great. Bye-bye, everybody, and thank you. <laughs>